Hi, my name is Chris LaFleur. Um, I work for Congress for Representative John Conyers. A couple days ago, I read about you talking about uh, artificial intelligence and the dangers of it, uh, and how as a, uh, as a businessman, you are totally against regulation and stuff like that, but as a, you know, a human being, you think it's critical that we get ahead of this issue. Yeah. Uh, can you please elaborate on um, like why, um, what are you seeing that we don't get to see, and uh, what, as a policymaker, I should be looking to do to sort of, I guess, protect us all? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, um, I think it, it, it is difficult to appreciate just how far um, artificial intelligence has advanced and how far it is advancing um, because we have a double exponential at work. Uh, we have an exponential increase in hardware capability um, and we have an exponential increase um, in software talent that is going into AI. Um, so whenever you have a double exponential, it's very difficult to predict. Um, people's predictions are almost always going to be too conservative in terms of thinking it'll be further out than it is. Um, you know, you start to see things like, um, I don't know if you've seen like the, the videos where you can sort of really quite accurately video simulate uh, someone um, and put words in their mouth that they never spoke. Um, you just Google this, it's really pretty amazing. Um, and then they, they had something called a generative adversarial network, uh, had, had two of them um, compete with one another to make the most convincing video. So one would generate the video and then the other one would identify where it, it, it looked fake and, and then that, that would, the other one would fix that and then and they'd go back and forth to the point where you couldn't tell which one was the real, real video and which one was the fake one. Um, and, um, you know, obviously there have been some very public things like the defeat of AlphaGo, or defeat of Go by AlphaGo, the world's best Go champion. People thought defeating Go was either never or 20 years away. That was, the world's best Go player was defeated. Um, and now that same AlphaGo system can defeat the top 50 players simultaneously with 0% of chance of them winning. Yep. And that's one year later. Um, so the degrees of freedom to which artificial intelligence is able to apply itself are in, in really increasing, I think, by 10 orders of magnitude a year. It's re that's really crazy. Um, so I think, uh, and, and we're starting, and this is on hardware that is really not well suited for neural nets. Um, you know, uh, like a GPU is maybe an order of magnitude better than a CPU, but something, but a, um, a chip that is designed optimally for neural nets is an order of magnitude better than a GPU. Um, and that is, there are a whole bunch of neural net optimized chips coming out um, either late this year or next year. Um, so I think we should, I think, that, you know, the Part of the role of government is to make sure the public is uh, safe, like to take care of public safety issues. And I think, so I think the right move is to establish some government regulatory agency, which at first is just there to gain insight. So um, it's not about like shooting from the hip and just putting in rules before anyone knows anything, but you've got to set up the agency, it's got to gain insight, once that insight is gained, then start applying rules and regulations. Um, we have that for the, you know, for aircraft, the FAA, we've got that for cars, we've got that for, uh, you know, drugs, for food. Um, and I don't think anyone wants the FAA to go away or the FDA to go away or, you know, um, any of those regulatory agencies. The, um, I think we just need to make sure people do not cut corners on AI safety. Gonna be a, it's going to be a real big deal, um, and it's going to come on like a like a tidal wave. So. Hi, Elon. Um, my name is Elia Overby. I'm a PhD student studying genomics. We've all made we've all together made a lot of technological progress um, on space systems. My question isn't about the technology; it's about the biology. Um, what are the principal biological concerns you have about human health on long duration missions, such as a mission to Mars? And 
Um, have you identified any solutions to these problems? Um, well, I'd say uh, <clears throat> going to Mars is not for the faint of heart. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's a risky, uh, dangerous, uh, uncomfortable, and you might die. <laughs> now do you want to go? Yeah. Um, you know, and for a lot of people, the answer is going to be hell no, and for some, it's going to be hell yes. Um, so, um, but it will, you know, there will be issues. Um, I don't think it's like it's, it's going to be a case of like you get irradiated to death along the way. I don't think that's the case at all. Um, you, you know, the, the radiation level is sort of roughly, you know, it, in a worst case scenario, really kind of about equivalent to smoking on the way there. Uh, now, smoking is pretty bad. <laughs> uh, but, um, but I think with, um, we, with, with some moderate shielding, we, we can cut down on um, a large percentage of the incremental radiation. Um, and that should be enough that, um, that the, the sort of marginal risk of cancer is not something that is going to be a showstopper. Um, that's, that's my best assessment uh, to date. Um, certainly learning a lot about solar winds and um, you know, fast particles and whatnot. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things I'd, I learned recently that I wasn't, didn't, didn't quite understand is that the, I always thought of the particles from the sun, the so, sort of solar wind as going kind of straight up from the sun, but they, they follow the magnetic field lines. Um, so you, you actually can get the particles coming at you from the side, even though you know, it's kind of at a direction orthogonal to the sun. Um, so you do need some, some amount of uh, pr protection, um, at least on, uh, yeah, on, on, on kind of four, four or five sides. Um, anyway, but I don't think it's, it's, it's not a showstopper, but it's, um, it's, it's definitely, you know, if, if safety is your top goal, I wouldn't go to Mars. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of work going on ISS right now to understand the risk to the humans for long duration. Yeah. Certainly, within, we're in the Van Allen belt, so the radiation environment's different. Yeah. But, uh, and all part of it is understanding what happens to the humans the longer you stay. So, sure. so far, we've had humans stay a little bit longer than a year, and that's it. So, yeah. in the history of the species, they've, we've had someone off the planet for a little more than a year, and we're talking three years to go to Mars. Well, you know, I think you can get the... Perhaps, perhaps shorter, but it's in the years. Uh, it's uh, you know, it's uh, so it, there, there, there's months. potential for for things out there that we haven't found yet. Yeah. And uh, so we'll we'll learn more as we go along. Hopefully, learn more before ISS is done. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. That actually, the you know, <clears throat> you know, Mars is only in the same um, sort of rough quadrant of the of, of Earth, six, roughly six months every two years. Um, by same, I mean sort of. Trans slightly offset because it's like a transfer quadrant, but um, but if you can get the ship to and from Mars in, inside that six-month window, then you get to reuse it twice as often. So there's actually a lot of merit to being mm -hmm. able to get to Mars uh, in under three months. If you can get there quick and back, of course, it makes a bigger a bigger uh, vehicle and and resupply. So anyway, we're, uh, interesting problem that we'll uh, I'm sure we'll work on here. Yeah. As we go forward, a lot, 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 of, lot of earth orbit refueling, or re pro yeah. pro it's not really mostly oxygen, but it's um, propellant reload. There's no good for word for propellant for fuel plus oxygen. Uh, <laughs> prop, I guess. Prop, prop load. We'll have to we'll have to invent a new word, right? So that's, that, yeah. that's it. Hello, I'm Anna Sofia Bagirayev, and I have kind of a follow-up on the biology question from before. It is one thing to say, obviously, it's not going to be a safe experience to go to Mars, but there are some technologies essential, especially if we're looking to putting humans there permanently, um, that, are going to be have, that are going to have to be developed with biological capabilities. Speaking of like flight suits, habitats, um, eventual artificial biospheres for people to live in, do you see your company playing a part in the development of those technologies? Do you see biology having a place in SpaceX's work, or will that be outsourced to other unrelated companies? Hey, and before you answer, you should know that Anna Sophia over here won uh, a Jeans in Space competition and flew on a SpaceX Dragon. Anna Sophia, was that, uh, was that SpaceX uh, 10? When was that? Eight. SpaceX 8. So um, 
as a, yes. Oh. And uh, a very smart uh, young lady. I think, in fact, I think she's smarter than me in high school than, uh, than, than I am now. So uh, anyway, so good luck with your answer. Sure. <laughs> uh, uh, biology obviously has a significant role to play in any kind of uh, permanent Mars base or city. Um, I mean, for, for SpaceX, you know, we, we're, we're trying to make sure we can get people there reliably at a, at a cost they can afford. Um, and get cargo there at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at the right cost number, you know, because there's, there's, there's kind of a threshold cost per ticket or a cost per ton to the surface of Mars, um, below which uh, a self-sustaining city can develop and above which it cannot. Um, that, that sort of critical um, sort of economic and te technical threshold is, um, is, is, what we're, is what we're focused on at SpaceX. Um, I think we'll probably also have to do a pivot of work on propellant depot, uh, basically a propellant plant on Mars. Um, but then our, t our intent is to, uh, uh, you know, we, we don't want to get in the way of, of what others are doing. Like, we want to make sure that, uh, let's say if somebody makes an investment and wants to do something on Mars, create a, you know, a business or do some scientific endeavor, that SpaceX does not compete with them, you know, because they need to feel like, okay, they're, we're not going to just go in and compete with them arbitrarily. Um, we we, we want to make sure that they, 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 they feel it's going to be a fruitful environment uh, to be the, you know, to go there and and and, uh, and, and, and do something special. Um, so our focus is going to be on transport, kind of fundamental utilities, survivability, um, and, and you know we'll and we'll do more if we need to do more. Uh, but um, but we want to make sure. That, that lots of people can go and do all sorts of things on Mars or the Moon, um, and not feel like SpaceX is going to do anything but try to help them. Uh, we don't want, we don't want to interfere or compete. Um, you know, they they got to feel like the opportunity is there. Uh, hi, Alan. Uh, my name is uh, Prafula Chandra. I'm a regenerative medicine scientist from Wake Forest University. Uh, my question is regarding your company Neuralink, uh, that makes uh, brain machine interfaces. Uh, so, uh, what do you think this technology, how is it useful for uh, humans when they, uh, you know, go into low Earth orbits or even deep space explorations, and do you have any plans in that direction? Well, the, the reason for, the reason I wanted to create Neuralink was uh, primarily as an offset to the existential risk associated with uh, artificial intelligence. Um, I think w we will human intelligence will be not, I mean, we will not be able to beat um, AI. So then if, you know, as the saying goes, if you can't beat him, join him kind of thing. Um, so I think having some, yeah, some basically kind of way to, to, to link, um, you know, uh, human will en masse to the outcome of, of AI. Um, having AI be an extension of individual human will, that's really the point of Neuralink. Now, along the way, I think there'll be a lot of good that's achieved in uh, addressing uh, any any brain damage that's you know as a result of a stroke or a lesion or something congenital, um, or just you know loss of memory when you get old, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, you know that'll, that'll happen well before it it, it becomes a sort of. Um, you know, brain AI symbiote situation. Um, so we plan. It, it, you'll see it coming. It'll be, it, won't, it won't. It won't happen all of a sudden. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think it, it, it increases the long-term relevance of human exploration. Um, and um, yeah, and yeah, I, mean, I think I think it's for, for me. It increased my motivation long-term. That that. It doesn't just need to be done by robots, you know. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but does that answer your question? Oh yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs>